The session is Left Main PCI in 2021. What have we learned for DK Kirsch 5 and ABC Main Study? So that's the title. Now, the people there are all good friends, okay? Hello, thank you for the opportunity to present at the European Bifurcation Club a meeting 2021 in this session dedicated to left main PCI. And my task is to provide you with a side by side comparison of the DK Crash 5 and the ABC main trials. A good starting point for this talk could be to remind uh, you about the uh, current recommendations regarding uh, uh, the strategy of a bifurcation stenting from the 2018 ESC EICTS guidance on micro revascularization. We have a one recommendation uh, for the provisional uh, approach, stent implantation in the main vessel only, followed by provisional balloon angioplasty with or without stenting of the side branch is recommended for PCI or bifurcation lesions. And this is class one, level of evidence A. And then we have one recommendation that is more specific to uh, left main uh, PCI. In true bifurcation lesions of the left main, the double kissing crush technique may be preferred over provisional T stenting. And this is class 2B, level of evidence B. The level of evidence is essentially due to uh, the uh, results of the DK crash uh, uh, 5 study that were published in 2017. And you may remember that this was a multi-center randomized uh, trial designed for super Priority that included 482 patients with two left main stem bifurcation lesions requiring intervention. These patients were randomized to DK crash stenting or provisional stenting. And the primary endpoint was a composite of cardiac death, MI, clinically driven target lesion revascularization at 12 months. The events were 5% in the DK crash stenting group and 10.7% in the provisional stenting group with a second bailout stenting, of course, if necessary. The hazard ratio was 0.42 and the p-value was significant at 0.02. There was a numerical difference in clinically driven TLR that may explain this uh, difference in the primary outcome. So there were 3.8% of uh, clinically driven TLR in the DK crash stenting group versus 7.9% in the provisional stenting group. The p-value was 0.06. This year, we have seen also the results of the ABC MEN trial that were uh, uh, presented at the Euro PCR and published simultaneously in the European Art Journal. More or less the same number of patients, again, a superiority uh, design. These were patients with true unprotected left main bifurcation disease with a side branch uh, of more than 2.75 millimeter in diameter. Uh, the investigation arm, however, here was provisional stenting with a stepwise layered provisional approach. Uh, and the control group was a planned dual stenting. So it was the other way around as compared with the uh, DK Crash 5 study. The primary point also was a, a little bit different because uh, there was no cardiac death, but all cause death. MI was the same. There was no clinically driven target lesion revascularization, but any target lesion revascularization at 12 months. So it was a, a more inclusive endpoint in a way. This may explain why we uh, saw more events. The provisional stenting group had a 14.7% of events, and the planned dual stenting strategy had a 17.7% of events. This corresponded to another ratio of 0.8, and the p-value was not significant, 0.34. Target lesion revascularization was also not significantly different between the two groups, but it was numerically in favor of the provisional stenting strategy, 6.1% versus 9.3%. So the provisional strategy was not superior. However, we have to acknowledge that some uh, secondary outcomes, such as procedure time, X-ray dose, and consumables were in favor of the simple strategy, so the provisional stenting approach. Now, let's look at some similarities, but uh, perhaps more importantly, some differences between the two trials. The first one is the presentation of patients uh, in terms of age, 71 years on average in the ABC main versus 65 years in DK Crash 5. Uh, chronic coronary syndromes were in two thirds of the patients, more or less, in the ABC main trial, and only in 16% in the other trial, where uh, most patients had unstable angina. The SINTA score was lower in the ABC main trial, 23 uh, was the median, while uh, the median was 31 in DK Crash 5. And also, uh, reflecting this uh, broader extension of atherosclerosis, uh, the extension of the disease in the side branch, so the length of uh, the uh, disease was a seven millimeter on average in the ABC main uh, trial and 16 millimeters, so more than double, in the DK-CRASH-5 study, where there were also more uh, trifurcation lesions. 
This is the uh, performance of the provisional uh, stenting strategy in the two uh, groups, uh, the provisional uh, approach, let's say. So we have data regarding main vessel preparation and side vessel preparation, which were similar in both studies. And in the ABC main uh, trial, the investigators also provided uh, more uh, granular data regarding the stepwise layered approach of both performed after first stent, kissing after the first stent, placement of the second stent if necessary, of course, and then and uh, kissing after the second stent and final uh, pot. Uh, the key difference between the two trials uh, is the placement of a second stent in the provisional arm, which was 22% in the ABC main, mostly with the tap or culotte uh, approach. Uh, in DK crash, it was uh, higher, 47%, which is what you would expect, of course, in situations where the side branch is more extensively uh, diseased. These are the results in the two provisional stenting arms that display that in terms of target lesion revascularization at uh, one uh, year at the center, uh, the performance was uh, better in the ABC main uh, trial with 6.1% of events versus 7.9% of events in the DK crash 5 study. When we look at the uh, groups uh, of uh, patients who received systematic two stent uh, uh, strategies, you see that in ABC main, uh, the main approaches were culotte in 53% of the cases and T or TAP in 33% of the cases, while in DK crash uh, uh, 5, uh, the approach was uh, by definition DK crash. It's also worthy uh, underscoring that uh, IVUS was uh, underused in both trials. 31% in ABC main and 43% in DK crash uh, 5. And these are the results of systematic two stent uh, side by side. You see that in ABC main with the culotte and T or TAP, the rate of TLR at one year was 9.3%, while it was much lower uh, with uh, DK crash and DK crash 5, uh, it was 3.8%. Putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, it seems that in terms of TLR, the results are explained by a good performance of the provisional approach in the ABC main and a good performance of the DK crash technique in the DK crash 5 study. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that in terms of interpretation, we have to be mindful that the DK crash 5 uh, trial met the superiority goal despite having lower than anticipated events according to the statistical plan. However, there was the same relative treatment effect, which in the end resulted in a positive uh, result. In ABC main, uh, the superiority goal was not uh, met, and this was in the context of lower than anticipated events and uh, also lower than anticipated treatment effect in the contour arm. These are two conditions that uh, statistically speaking may have biased the results towards uh, neutrality. However, we have to recognize also that there are several differences between the ABC main and DK crash five trials. And these include, as we have seen, definitions of the primary endpoint, extent of disease and need for a second stent in the provisional arm, performance of the provisional strategy, and finally, the techniques used in the systematic two stenting arms. Thank you very much for your attention. So that was a, a brilliant, brilliant exercise uh, of Davide to compare uh, apple and orange or banana, I don't know, but uh, extremely difficult. I think that um, he didn't mention the geographic aspect, the training, and potentially the early interference of an angiographic follow-up and the decomposition of the angiographic follow-up with the clinical comment. I think and uh, so in the next uh, part of the, uh, of the, the session, we will have uh, um, a discussion on uh, the people that, on the person, David, which is clearly, I think, clearly because uh, after ABC main result uh, is against DK crush and indeed Santoso, which is pro DK crush. So please, let's see the argument from, from both of you. So the first to start is going to be David. Yeah. Is DK crush the gold standard for complex DSLF main stenosis? And his argument is no. Great. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Alaid. Is DK crush the gold standard for complex distal left main stem stenosis? And I'm taking the no standpoint. So just to remind everyone, I know it's the end of two days of talking about this, but the EBC perspectives are very important on this. And that is that for nearly 20 years, uh, the EBC as a whole has decided to approach bifurcations not in a prejudged manner,
but in a stepwise manager, laying, laying the complexity in as necessary and stopping when we have a good result. You end up sometimes with two stents, but only when necessary. So for example, if you have a left main stem stenosis, you'll stent the main vessel and then do proximal optimization and then ask yourself, how does it look? Do we need to do anything more? If we do, then we rewire the side branch and do a kissing inflation. And at that stage, you'll stop and ask, do we need to do some more? If we do, we'll stem the side branch, do a kiss, perhaps a repot. Do we need to do more? So at each stage, it's logical, it's rigorous, and most importantly, it's versatile, it's flexible. It offers the option to do less rather than more. You may have heard this a few times at this meeting, but I do love it. As Jens Lassen likes to say, if you start with one stent, you can always end up with two. But if you start with two stents, you can't end up with one. So why is it that DK Crush has taken the plaudits to the extent that, rather to my surprise, it went straight into the guidelines? Well, firstly, you've got to give enormous credit to the team of Xiaoyang Chen, who've produced an enormous body of work on DK Crush with numerous studies. And secondly, perhaps there are some geographies in particular, but certainly it's a, it's a concept for us all that if the immediate angiographic result is very satisfying, that's quite seductive. So let's just look briefly at the drawbacks of DK Crush and why it shouldn't be the gold standard. Well, its, it's biggest drawback probably is its inflexibility. It commits you to two stents right from the start. And as we've seen from EBC Maine, that's not any longer necessarily supported by the whole body of data that we've now accumulated, with EBC Maine showing a very neutral result for European patients. DK Crush requires many steps for completion, at least 10. And it is true that every additional procedural step you have to do offers you an innovative and creative way to totally mess up the case. And not that this is necessarily worth anything, but I've said it probably every year since the EBC started, and that, and that is that there's nothing more likely to go wrong than a complicated bifurcation strategy undertaken as something of a novelty. And we all see this in our clinical practice. We see a case done, maybe not in our hospital, maybe somewhere else, and you think, oh my God, they did, they did what? But that must have been the first time they've done that in a year. Why did that happen? So, of course, it went wrong. The third drawback, I think, is simply that there's a triple layer of stent on the inner curvature here. You would never design a strategy to have that. It's a mild limitation. Perhaps more importantly, though, it is a technique where rewiring outside the stented area is quite possible. As you can see, in this case, if you rewire into this stent vacuum, you will then crush the stent more and create an area where there is dissection but no coverage with stent. That's not a good outcome. That's not going to give you a good long-term result. I'm quite surprised that that doesn't result in measurable adverse clinical outputs in the, in the DK crush studies. We've heard from David Day about the comparison between the two studies, so I'm not going to discuss this in much detail except to make a couple of points. Where the pot happened during the DK crush study is unclear. If it didn't occur at the start after the first tent, that may contribute to the slightly underwhelming results in the provisional group. Of course, if you have one group against another, but in the one group you have nearly 50% take the second strategy, you're going to limit the difference you can see between them. The stent thrombosis rates were surprisingly high for the provisional, perhaps surprisingly low for the DK. And I think this is a major drawback which does have to be mentioned. There was clearly 
an oculostenotic reflex around the time of the angiography, which was supposed to be after the 12 month follow up, but didn't always happen there. And this is no doubt contributed to the difference between the two groups in terms of target lesion revascularization. Briefly, the anatomy was different in the two studies, 16 versus seven millimeters in DK Crush versus EBC Main, and the syntax scores were different. So basically, from the European point of view, and maybe the US point of view, we don't see these lesions really. These are lesions which pretty much require a stent in their own right. If it's 16 millimeters long and it's significant, well, you're going to stent it. So this all suggests to me that the Chinese patients are, are different in the way that they present and the type of disease and the anatomy, and that the Chinese approach is different. There's a philosophy bias. The Europeans, their heart is in provisional. The Chinese group as a whole, perhaps, their heart is more in DK crush from their experience with that. And they're clearly very, very good at it. Perhaps they're not quite so good at provisional in the same way that we probably wouldn't be very good at DK crush if we now took it up. So I think my conclusions really for this description of why I think DK crush is not the gold standard is that firstly, it's clear that you can use a provisional or a systematic technique, probably interchangeably in those with definition style distal left main stems. A provisional resulting in two stents is equally applicable to the systematic dual. And I think really, you know, this argument is starting to get a little bit um, skewed. I don't think it's about DK crush as such, and it shouldn't be. It, it, the main thing is, if you're doing a complex left main bifurcation, you should learn a technique and apply it rigorously and carefully and get good at it. And so I don't think the DK crush is itself the gold standard because overall, actually, the technique itself is much less important than its application. Thank you. So that's a typical debate and talk a la David. It's a mixture of uh, philosophy, irony, logical and pseudological argument, but mixed with fact. And I must say, over the years when you hear David, most of the time, the first reaction, he must be right. But I think that uh, is uh, final conclusion because it's, uh, it's quite unique to have a trial in different continent. And I think his, his last conclusion is, uh, is very correct. I mean, you have to, to master what you do and then you are good in it and the results are good. My big question here is what the time is going to tell us because the result of the trial is never in one year, is not even after three and five, you have some time to go a long time. Take for instance bypass surgery these days, in many subgroup the curve, the curve converge because we forgot that uh, a saphenous vein graft get worn out after six, seven years. That's something uh, which was not always in the mind of the uh, surgeon. Uh, no. Counterpart, so um, Dr. Santoso indeed saying that DK crush should be the gold okay. standard for complex distal left main stenosis. No. So please, Dr. Santoso, if you give your talk. So yeah. My most sincere thanks to the organizing committee for kindly inviting me to deliver a talk on whether TK Cross is the gold standard for complex cell left main stenosis. I have nothing to disclose. A lot of factors may define the complexity of a publication lesion. Until we have the criteria set by the definition studies, no unique definition for a complex publication lesion exists within the literature. In the definition, study led by Dr. Chen Xuelian, a complex left main distal propagation is defined as the presence of one major criteria, including here 
uh, side branch diameter stenosis of more than 70% and lesion length, the side branch of more than 10 mm, and the presence of two mi minor criteria, which may include the presence of more than mild calcifications, multiple lesions, fabrication angle of uh, less than 45% or more than 70%, main vessel reference uh, diameter of less than 2.5 mm, main vessel lesion length of more than 25 mm, and thrombus containing lesion. So again, complex fabrication lesions is the presence of one major, uh, one or two, plus any of the two minors. Complex fabrication lesions in this study were found to be associated with more adverse events as compared to simple fabrication lesions, including here higher rates of one-year maze, cardiac death, myocardial infarction, and stent thrombosis. If we compare two stent strategies versus a professional stenting strategy subgroup in this uh, clinical study, in hospital myocardial infarction and major adverse cardiac events are significantly lower in those uh, undergoing two stent procedures, whereas at one year, cardiac death is also uh, significantly lower in those undergoing two stent procedure. Major adverse cardiac events were the same. It is also important to note that the occlusion of the sizable side brands is associated with adverse uh, clinical outcomes, as shown here in the COVID registry. Uh, here, uh, increased uh, cardiac death and myocardial infarction, maze, and also stent thrombosis. We owe a lot to Dr. Chen Xiaoliang for introducing us the DK cross standing technique. I think we all know about these techniques, and this is just to show uh, the picture of that. But uh, nowadays, uh, refined procedures include not only DK cross and uh, the, the necessity of guide wire to cross uh, the proximal side transcend but also pot and repot, casing balloon dilatation with minimal balloon overlapping and the use of short balloon for the side branch. And this is the DK Crush 5 randomized trial showing here that uh, in simple lesions and complex lesions, DK Crush is definitely superior as compared to professional sending strategy. The absolute benefit is was greater in the more complex lesions here. And another in, uh, important study is the definition to study. Uh, they use the same criteria for uh, complex uh, uh, stenosis. And in this study, again, they showed that at one year, TLR, target lesion myocardial infarction, and target lesion failure were significantly less than those undergoing DK crust as compared to professional standing strategy group. Can we compare the result of DK cross trials with the uh, EBC main? Uh, if we look carefully, then we know that uh, uh, in the DK cross trials, a lot more operators are uh, experienced and uh, the primary endpoint is different and uh, lesion complexity seems to be worse in the DK class 5 as indicated by higher syntax score and longer uh, side brand lesion length. And upfront two stand strategies are DK class in all here as compared to pull out and tap procedures in the EBC main. And uh, crossover to two stand from provisional is 45, 41% as compared to 22. So comparing these two trials are not just comparing apple to apple, but probably apple to orange. I would like to present several case examples why, where TK crust is definitely preferred over provisional static strategy. Case number one, a patient with uh, highly calcified left wing publication stenosis as shown here, and also a narrow angle between uh, LED and LCX. High syntax score, euro score, and nurse score. So, uh, this is definitely uh, an indication for the crust. And you'll see here, I have to do rota and then uh, uh, continue with the DK crust procedures. And we obtain excellent final result as shown here. And at one year follow up, there is no resonosis. Case number two, DK crust for very complex, heavily calcified life main publication stenosis and severe triple vessel disease. Again, a patient who has a high PCI and surgical risk, and you'll see here very nasty looking above uh, stenosis, 
diffuse disease in the LED and uh, in the CERC. And of course, uh, after stenting uh, the lesions in the uh, mid and uh, proximal LED and LCX, uh, I embark on implanting stents with a decay cross technique to fix the buffication stenosis and obtain an excellent result like this. And this is at three years follow up, no resinosis. Another case example of a patient with double bifurcation stenosis involving LCX and obtuse marginal and also left end bifurcation here. Uh, we fix this with the double DK cross technique. And then this is uh, the procedure. Uh, we implanted the two stand uh, in the left main and obtuse marginal and also uh, two stands in the left main and also LED and also left main LCX with the uh, double DK cross procedure and obtain good results like that. And this is at one year follow-up, no resonances. This is another case example uh, of a case uh, with uh, left main trafication stenosis. You'll see here uh, the intermediate branch is very important here. And uh, we use TK crust to fix these uh, lesions. And then uh, we implanted the stand uh, from the left main to the intermediate branch and then uh, left main to the LED using the TK crust technique and obtain excellent final result like that. And this is no resonances at one year follow-up. So in conclusion, Philosophy of making complex matters simple may not be necessarily true for PCI of complex life information. TK Cross and Definition 2 study showed that TK Cross provides better outcome as compared to professional stenting. Comparing TK Cross and EBC main is like comparing apple to orange and not apple to apple. An integrated approach that combines careful selection, proper pre-procedural planning and specialized technique with adjunctive intracoronary imaging plus or minus functional assessment is likely to further improve the success rate and long-term clinical PCI outcomes of complex lab main publication lesion. Thank you. So, Tegu, I, I can say you did very well. You did very well because uh, it's not easy to debate with uh, David. I think the impression in general, at least it's my impression, we need more time to judge. That's point number one. The jury is still out. I don't think that's final. And it is indeed apple and orange. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a little bit philosophical, but that's the case. But uh, you have seen that uh, an operator like Tegu, Tegu can do a wonderful, uh, wonderful job. Okay, the panel now. The panel has to say uh, what they think about it. Yeah, but one question is that I would do also to, to you and to all the panel. Do we think we need other trial? Because ABC main actually was not stepwise provisional versus DK crash. Uh, in the ABC main, there were other kind of techniques. It was uh, the mini crash and it was a clot. So do you think now we need an head-to-head -head comparison or do we think that the data that we have are enough? I mean, that's my The best. recruitment and okay. the difficulty will take a long time, you know, to do it. And if you want to compare, say, TAP and Coulot versus DK Crush, it's just going to take a long time unless you have a large volume centers participating. Okay. Gary Mintz, what do you think about it? The wise man. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'm wise, um, but I think that if you look around the world, very good, very busy operators have evolved to a strategy that works for them, their patients, and their referral base. And so if you go to Nanjing, 100% DK crush. But if you go to Seoul, 100% provisional stenting, except when the bifurcation is... Um, diseased with a long segment of disease. And you can't argue with either of those um, centers because they get excellent results. So you have to factor in people getting technically excellent at the strategy that they have decided to adopt and to stick to. 
Um, you have to also realize that there's not only differences in angiographic disease, but probably differences in plaque morphology in different parts of the world that is almost impossible to factor in. Um, and you also have to factor in um, how the patients are followed long term or what the medical therapy is and so on. So um, I'm not sure this is, I'm not sure it's possible, nor do I think it's really necessary to settle this argument. Um, you know, sometimes you just say, well, you like this and, you know, some people like meat and some people like fish and they both, you know, live a nice, healthy life. No, I agree. The only problem is guidelines, because now, at least in S yeah. guidelines, there were some indication for DK crash, and it was honestly yeah. how they were drafted, at least for me, a little bit equivocal. So the problem is when you have this kind of data, then they reflect on the guidelines, and in most of the countries, guidelines counts. I mean, I can't yeah. from a I... point of view, so that, that's all the problem. Yes. So I will say categorically that I have never read a single guideline. Okay. <laughs> and I, and I never <laughs> intend to. No, no. The problem is uh, if you get sued, by the way, I mean, it's not easy to say. The judge read. And by the way, in Italy, it's, a, it's uh, written that you have to take care about the guidelines. I mean, yeah. I'm not joking. Yeah. That, they are <laughs> European guidelines taking yeah. data from the rest of the world, and uh, mm -hmm. that's a little bit unusual uh, because that's basically one of the first time that you see something coming clearly from another continent with a great expertise mm -hmm. that we don't have in Europe, of many of us does not. And to see that in the guideline, there is an element mm -hmm. of risk there, I, I must agree. Uh, before going back to David, who want to say something, Adrian and, and Robert Gill, what are you expecting with time in these two trials? And are we going uh, to be able to look back at these trials with whatever you want, a vital status at five years, seven years, ten years? I would like to return to the, to the question of uh, Allied. For me, there is no need for such a trial. We have still we have enough data showing that provisional T-stenting works beautifully for certain tertile of, 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 of uh, patients. We know how we should deal with these kinds of lesions, and this stepwise European approach allows us, let's say, to implement the optimization of the verification treatment with additional stent implantation. And then there's a question, which technique is the best yeah. Might be we need, a, 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 let's say, a real trial comparing two stance techniques. But first, Europeans should be trained by Asians, Chinese, how to deal properly with DK crash. We should show them how we tackle the, the bifurcation problem, uh, 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 reasons, for example, with TAP. So for me, this is not a matter of time showing which one is better because the DK crash five was unfair to provisional key standing. This is my opinion. Okay, the time for discussion is uh, over, but Adrian, then the last word for this uh, debate. I guess w my preconception would be that you might expect that the provisional may have more events early and that the two stent uh, approach may have more events late. So it may be that the provisional may see benefit going forward. That would be my guess. Very good. I thought that was quite uh, entertaining, yeah? And I think, as I said, the jury is still out, in my opinion. Okay, now we will have a, a debate to put or not to put data from ABC Maine by uh, Pietro La Forgia. So, dear chairman, thank you for the invitation to present uh, at the EBC 2021 meeting. Uh, my name is uh, Pietro La Forgia. I work uh, as an interventional cardiology fellow at the Institute Cardiovascular Paris Sud Amassi in France. And the title of my presentation is To Pot or Not To Pot Data from the ABC Main. So, I don't need to go too long on this topic. Why pot? 
because uh, here uh, the audience, I think, is uh, everybody is aware of why we have to perform both proximal optimization technique, basically for three reasons. First reason is to optimize uh, stent expansion and uh, position in the proximal main branch. Second reason is to avoid carrying a shift and reduce the obstruction of the side branch by pushing aside the um, struts of the stent implanted towards the distal main branch. And then to facilitate rewiring the same branch, avoiding uh, uh, rewiring behind the struts for the same reason. And not only is it important to perform pot, but it is important to perform a good pot, correct pot, an adequate pot. And the uh, 15th uh, EBC consensus of bifurcation showed us how to perform um, correct pot with a short non-compliant balloon uh, with the edge of the balloon, which has to be perfectly positioned and the proximal, immediately proximal to the carina, reaching the proximal stent edge in order to avoid carina shift if the balloon is too distal or incomplete expansion uh, towards the side branch ostium if the balloon is too uh, proximal. And the EBC main was a randomized trial recently published on the European Art Journal 2021, um, which uh, randomized 467 patients with the true left main bifurcation lesions, it was, uh, Medina 111 or 011, to a stepwise provisional strategy versus a two-stand strategy up front. And uh, we all know the result of this uh, very important trial. Uh, no difference in the primary endpoint, which was a composite of uh, death, MI, or target lesion revascularization, were found at 12 months between the patients uh, randomized to provisional stepwise strategy or dual stent upfront strategy. And we also have to underline that uh, side branch stenting was performed only in uh, one fifth of patients, actually 22% of patients in the provision. Uh, what we um, were interested to see is uh, was to see if POT had some impact on the outcome of these patients. Actually, POT proximal optimization technique was mandatory by protocol in the ABC main, but actually uh, from the data we received from uh, the multiple centers who were involved, probably because of operator uh, preference, around 15%, 15% of patients did not undergo POT. And what we looked for uh, in this uh, sub-analysis, which I'm going to show the result uh, in a while, was to see uh, with a core lab reanalysis of procedures if an adequate POT was performed and patients in, included. And actually, by relooking at angels and the procedures, uh, adequate POT with the characteristic uh, we uh, described a few slides uh, before, uh, was not performed in around 12% of patients, actually 11.8% of patients uh, from both groups. What was interesting to see, very striking to see, is this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve that shows that the outcome of patients who did not undergo correct POT uh, was extremely worse than patients uh, who uh, underwent correct POT. Actually, the events were doubled in patients uh, uh, who did not undergo uh, correct POT with a composite uh, endpoint that we described earlier at 12 months. And this was uh, maintained uh, in both groups. This couple of of the patients uh, who underwent uh, a randomization to stepwise provisional strategy, uh, although non statistically non-significant, was a big numerical difference, which was appearing through time. But the statistical uh, significance was maintained in the dual stent strategy uh, group. Uh, what we checked uh, also was uh, to see if POT had any impact on the procedure. And actually, no uh, increase of procedural time, fluoroscopy time, or uh, the amount of contrast uh, administered to the patients were found in patients with POT or without POT. And this was uh, no difference in the, in the provisional group. And no difference with what find um, were found uh, rather um, patients who underwent a second stent in the provisional uh, group. Uh, moreover, what we checked was uh, the QCA analysis, which was performed by Core Lab again, by the independent Core Lab. And what is uh, interesting to find, but probably expected, was that the difference 
was uh, a statistically significant difference was found in means of the minimal diameter of the proximal main branch in patients who underwent POT or not though no differences were found in the minimal diameter in the distal main branch or the side branch. This was quite uh, expected, but still could explain uh, uh, at least partially the reason why so much more events were found. So to conclude, we have to say that POT is a fundamental step in the treatment of true bifurcation lesions, especially when a dual stent approach is performed. And the striking difference was found in uh, terms of events at 12 months follow-up in patients of the ABC main uh, uh, trial. And it is a fundamental step and also does not increase procedural time or contrast media administered. So we, again, underline the importance of performing this crucial step of bifurcation stenting. And probably uh, the reason why we had so much reduction of maize at one year is that POT uh, allows good expansion, good opposition of the stent in the proximal main branch, and in this case, clearly, the left main. Thank you for the attention and uh, looking forward to any questions, uh, if you have it. Okay, I think that that was really a, a clear story because on the log rank, when you get the p-value of uh, 007, I think it was, uh, with something which is 85% uh, versus 15%, then there is a clear message. Therefore, there is no debate about that, at least. But do you have a question? Who, who oppose the pot? Who is against? Raise your hand. I think that, the, ah, he's, he's not opposing, but he had a question. And be careful, they're always, always smart question there. Yeah, did you see, uh, did you prove the balloon size, which was really used uh, for final for final pop? Because normally we have to take 5.0, 5.5, like, something like this. I think what was done was uh, checked by the core lab. Of the, uh, we, we did the study, and the core lab adjudicated whether the pot was adequately performed in terms of position of the balloon and size of the balloon. So that was the point, I think. Yeah, so sometimes people said, I have done a pot. They use the balloon of the stent. Yeah, they go to higher pressure, it's a pot. But it's not a pot. A pot is defined by the uh, Murray's law or Finet's law, according to LED and CERC and then. So the core lab, and uh, I think uh, Antoinette is here, no? So Antoinette was uh, doing the core lab and uh, uh, there were some cases where it was point that it was a pot, but the collapse said, no, yeah, it's exactly. not a pot. Uh, I think it's interesting also in line with the... So the pot should be a pot, yeah, not exactly. a, a false pot. Uh, also with data showed by Dr. Chevalier with the Ultimas Registry, I think it's again a demonstration on the need of doing good pot, good pot also in a randomized trial. Let me uh, uh, introduce uh, Adrian Banning. He's going to talk about uh, side branch lesion length and, and outcome. Hello, my name is Professor Adrian Banning. I work in Oxford. And it's my pleasure to give the final presentation of the European Bifurcation Club meeting 2021. Today, I'm going to talk about side branch lesion length and outcome from the EBC main trial. Hopefully this audience are familiar with this trial. It was published in the European Heart Journal uh, last week, but presented for the first time at uh, EuroPCR by David Hildick Smith in May. So this was a trial of 467 patients presenting with left main disease, which affected both the LED and the circumflex. In the trial overall, there was a seven millimeter mean lesion length and 2.7 millimeter mean reference diameter in the circumflex when assessed by QCA. As you know, the trial essentially compared a stepwise provisional strategy against a systematic two stent strategy. Importantly, uh, in the provisional strategy, one patient in five required a second stent. When we look at what the two stent strategy was, Collot was used in 53%, TAP in 33% and DK crush in only 5%. 93% had a final kissing balloon inflation. And the outcome was a composite of death, MI or TLR with a 12 month outcome. 
And these are the main results. And as you know, it shows comparable outcomes for the two strategies, either stepwise provisional or systematic dual. So the question we asked ourselves was how much did side branch disease, how much side branch disease was there and how did that influence the outcomes of the trial? You'll all be also aware of the definition criteria. And importantly, in this paper by Xiaolang Chen, we saw that complex disease, as defined by the definition criteria, their complex bifurcations had a worse outcome, as you see in the panel on the right-hand side there. The simple group in purple did less well than the complex group in green. Importantly, to have a complex uh, bifurcation by definition criteria, as long as it's left main, you have a side branch stenosis of more than 70% and a lesion length of more than 10, then it's complex. In the analysis we're showing, the lesion length of the side branch comes from the carina to the end of the disease, as shown in the cartoon on the left-hand side there. It does not include any disease proximal to the carina. So this is a post-hoc analysis from the EBC main trial. The side branch QCA has been performed by an independent core lab. And we've classified the side branch disease according to four different uh, approaches. A cutoff of 10 millimeters, what the median value of the observed population was, what the tertiles are, low, medium, and high, and how the bifurcation complexity could be judged according to that definition criteria. As you know, within the trial, all events were adjudicated by the Clinical Events Committee, and that primary endpoint, as I've already pointed out, death, MI, and TLR. The analyses that we've done, or Federico has done, were done on an intention to treat basis using the RStudio software. So this slide is quite important because it shows the distribution of the disease within the recruited cohort. And you see that actually most of the disease was relatively focal. The vast majority, less than 10 millimeters in length. We can see the two different approaches here. Provisional is in pink and blue uh, is the systematic. But you see that they were pretty much matched. And importantly, the uh, side branch disease in uh, diameter distribution is also shown there with relatively small amounts at the higher levels of stenosis, vast majority less than 75%. So this is a very different population to the population treated within the definition two trial. So this is the first analysis looking at side branch lesion length. In the top panel, less than 10 millimeters. In the bottom panel, greater than 10 millimeters. So importantly, in the bottom panel, those longer lesions, we see relatively small numbers of patients at risk on, in the Kaplan-Meier curve. But we see a trend towards favoring systematic dual approach, but it is just a trend. This is where we've taken the median and we've done the same analysis. At the top, we've got the shorter lesions where you see that the two uh, curves pretty much lie on top of each other. And at the bottom, we've got uh, greater than 5.177, the median really no difference in those appearances. And here we've done a tertile analysis of the lesion length. In those very short lesions in the left-hand panel, you could perhaps argue that there is a trend towards favoring the provisional stepwise approach. And here are those tertiles again, first tertile, second tertile, third tertile, looking at the outcomes. Once again, the more complex uh, two-stent approach, really showing no benefit in these analyses. And when we look at the definition criteria in the bottom panel, those that are positive to the definition criteria, the first thing to point out is uh, that the numbers there are very, very small. But there is a trend for uh, preferential outcome for this systematic two-stent approach whether we look at the primary endpoint in the left panel, TLR in the middle panel, or myocardial infarction in the right panel, which actually myocardial infarction comes out as statistically significant, despite the very small number of patients. So that's an interesting finding that in the EBC main uh, trial, those patients who fulfilled the definition criteria there is a trend towards an improved outcome with a two-stent approach. So in conclusion, only a few patients, including the EBC main trial, meet the criteria for a complex bifurcation lesion if you use the definition criteria. 
4.25%. There were no significant differences observed between provisional stenting and systematic dual stenting across the different cutoffs of side branch lesion length, but a trend was noted in favor of provisional stenting in the presence of discrete short side branch lesion length, those within the first tertile. And provocatively, in the presence of a complex lesion bifurcation according to definition criteria, systematic dual stent strategy appeared to show a significant reduction in MI at 12 months, but this result should be interpreted cautiously because of the very small sample size. I look forward to discussing these results with you. Cheers. That, that was a very astute uh, analysis. I mean, uh, and what is interesting is that, uh, Adrian, you have basically now in your hand with this small number and sometime uh, borderline difference, you have really uh, the instrument to power something in the future. I mean, about this 10 millimeter, either on the enzyme or on the outcome. What do you think about that? Yes, I mean, I hope that uh, with time, these differences may actually magnify. So it is interesting, I think. Um, and uh, I think the trends are what we might predict clinically, aren't they? Adrian, there is no cut-off value saying that we have to move to uh, systematic side branch stenting before the, the, the crossover stenting. No cut-off well, value. Not it's not possible to generate that. What, what I think the, the most important message here, which is, endorses what has been said before, is that this population in this trial are very different to the Chinese population in their trials. And therefore, the, the messages we can get from this are somewhat limited. Um, but I'd also point out it was very difficult to recruit to this trial. You know, this trial was almost stopped twice because it was recruiting so slowly. And so for all of our enthusiasm, there's a uh, bunch of experts, as a group of friends and colleagues, we do need to address the fact that recruiting to these trials is difficult. And, uh, and, and it, it, we now have the opportunity to follow these patients up, as Patrick has said, and we look forward to two, three, four, five year data. But whatever trial we do next, we have to bear in mind it is difficult to recruit. Yeah. So we have Francesco and Imad. Let me do a, one comment of that. The best way to plan a trial is to work on the data provided by the previous one, because there you have a, a signal and you can anticipate what will be the power calculation, the sample size for the next one. That's what we have done in an old carrier going from one trial to the others based on the result of the, the last one. Uh, that, that's quite interesting. What can happen also is that the signal that you see at one year will get intensified with the years uh, and, and the, on the signal of the enzyme and the signal on the uh, somewhat better outcome if you go above the uh, 10 millimeter. That's a very important piece of information. I like that division in Tersile. Francesco and Imad after that, yeah? Adrian, thank you very much for this really bright analysis. I know that you asked to have this data, and I think that you really provided new light into the interpretation of the differences between the results into the, uh, the two trials, DK Crash 5 and the EBC Main. Indeed, I mean, as Davide has perfectly out outlined, there are many differences that are both in the angiographic appearance, the clinical uh, aspect of the patient's different age, SINTA score, and different techniques. And as EBC, we focused a lot on the differences in the techniques. So we, we thought that uh, the uh, better provisional might, uh, I mean, change completely the, the ground. S somewhat it worked. However, now I think that after this data, we may understand the fact that uh, the, when you, you have very long disease, which was uh, one of the critic we uh, advocated as Thierry also did here, uh, if you have long disease, you deserve a stent. And uh, then in, in the DK Crash 5, they decided the good lesions for a good technique. 
and uh, we interpreted the fact that there was lung disease. They interpreted that the results were good due to the fact that there was a good technique comparable with the provisional. Indeed, I think that the EBC main dual stenting technique, which did not include the DK crash, was able in the lesions where DK crash had a benefit to provide the same benefit, hmm. provide, despite the fact that the numbers are uh, small, the, I think that the signals of Kaplan-Meier curves are really consistent. Very good. That was more a comment than a question, Imad. I think um, the comparison between uh, EBC main and uh, DK crash 5, uh, it's out, uh, out, of, of, out of place because they are including a totally different population. And I think the presentation of Adrian fixed the right di direction. Uh, that means uh, even EBC main, if you look on complexity be, uh, in, among these patients, you will see some difference coming up. So the direction now is to define who are those 22% of population of uh, EBC main trial who need two stents technique and then uh, provision will be applied for the, all the other 80% of, of population. So I, I think that the main thing is to uh, define what is complex and the need for two stents before planning your procedure. Okay, go back for uh, Eve. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm, I don't agree completely with uh, uh, Imad is telling. I think double stunting is part of the provisional strategy. It's part of the provisional strategy. That provisional means you, you are st stepping your procedure yeah. regarding the progress of your, your work. That was and the even first if you line. have a 40 millimeter lens, measure well, lens is the circumflex, you can imagine that you, you can treat the main vessel first. Well, actually, actually maybe I'm, I am wrong also in this because actually all population in EBC main could be treated by provisional stenting. That means short lesion on side branch, then simple bifurcation. I, I, my intention is to say that you should, we all agree that 20% of population, what we are seeing every day in clinical practice, cannot be applied to this population. I mean, are different, having different characteristics of the lesion, and cannot be uh, proposed for provisional stenting. That means you should, for this population, you should plan two stent technique. And I think the yeah, results yeah. will be completely different. It's always the same problem. I, I agree. I have been in China with you, Imad, uh, many times. It's very clear that the lesions they are treated there, they are treating there, are not the one we see here. Very clear. But uh, uh, I, I think you cannot say that uh, when uh, a lesion is uh, uh, more than 10, was suggested, you have to do a DK crush. I, I've, I've never done a DK crush, never. And I, have, I, I had patients with 20, meter, 20 millimeter lesion in, in the circumflex, you know? So but it's I, not I, impossible. It's Eve, technical, the, but not impossible. I think Eve the And we saw your pictures. You, we saw your photo on the WhatsApp chat. You did the DK crush. Actually, you did in vitro. Never, never, was... never I did a DK crush, never. No, no, we yeah. saw the picture you did on a model. There was a joke on that. Uh, on a model, yeah, on a model. Yeah, yeah. On a model. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Let, let me tell you, I think the first slide of uh, David was clearly what you said. You keep your option. Uh, just an anecdote, I mean, my first crush was by accident, okay? I dislodged the stand and it was halfway in the main vessel. And then, uh, yeah, I improvised what was a crush. And immediately I called Antonio Colombo and said, look, I've done this, what should I do now? I mean, uh, I crushed the vessel. I've, uh, oh, he said, I'm doing that on a regular basis. It have done only few one at that time, but okay. So um, we have to go to finish that uh, meeting. There is uh, 11 minutes discussion on the next uh, ABC trial led by myself. We'll do one minute, but let me tell you what we are doing. Uh, I think in 2019, this great man, Yves Louvar, retired. That's correct, more or less, yeah. And uh, he went to Brittany, yeah, okay. 
And then uh, at a certain point, I was also retired, so uh, we start to discuss about how can we improve the quality of these trial in bifurcation. I must say that there have been improvement, but there was more technical development that real strategy of uh, trial. And you know what we see today, ABC versus uh, uh, the trial of uh, Dr. Shen is a, a good example of that. So, we went together in, uh, in uh, Rotterdam. I think there are some pictures of that. And a little bit by accident, we say, okay, we should uh, make the rule of engagement for trial and try to think uh, all the things, all what we have learned in the past. Now, immediately, uh, Eve came with a slide deck of 259 slides, which is all these famous slides of the meeting. Uh, which make our life somewhat easier, but also more complicated, because when you have 259 slides on the screen, it is difficult. Then there was a name, a, back, a, bo a little bit by accident, a name called BFARC. Let's, let's work on the BFARC. And uh, we have done that. Of course, came the COVID. We slowed down everything and the connection. Uh, we restarted to work uh, recently. And at this meeting uh, yesterday, between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock, we work uh, on slide. I mean, there was 40 minutes on slide on the so-called BFARC. I think there was a lot of uh, good ID. Uh, I hope that we will continue. Uh, why did we call that BFARC by accident? I think because Technically speaking, you have ARC-1, ARC-2, ARC-3, which is all the way to do trial in coronary artery disease. Then with Marty Leon and, uh, and the others, we did the VARC-1, VARC-2, VARC-3. Roxanne was busy with PARC. There is also BARC, sorry, there is also PARC. There is also NARC uh, that can go forever. So BFARC, I think, uh, deserve to be seriously, um, we should seriously think about it. Uh, we start to do that. Uh, maybe in the future, maybe there is one slide that I can show tonight. I don't think that we are going to discuss that in detail. But clearly, there is multiple options. If I may have the slide, which was one of the 60 slides of yesterday, they are a huge table. We could spend the whole night, but there is, uh, it's a very simple slide. But of course, the uh, options are huge, yeah? You have, of course, the first in men, yeah? And the first in men in, in my career has been always surprised by what comes out from first in men and what is introduced. You have seen the Creole balloon. I can be sure that sometime somebody will do a first in man on the Creole balloon uh, in bifurcation. So that's certainly uh, uh, a field. What we have done so far is just comparison of percutaneous procedural strategies. That's what we have done and concentrate on that. And we try to make the rule of engagement very serious. If you remember, long time ago I was questioning this intention to treat and cross over which was contaminated many of these trials. But it's not a crossover. It's a strategy of provisional, so it has to be perceived in, the, in a very positive way. Uh, device comparison, we really get engaged on that. I mean, uh, stent versus stent, but stent versus DCB. I think it's a serious contender, but our discussion this afternoon was not the best in the sense that we don't have a clear idea what we want to achieve with drug coating balloon. And the trial always start with a clear <laughs> hypothesis. Yeah, it's rely. So if I have an advice in that field, I would say collect all these things of the CB and try to get numbers because the trial is. Uh, it's an hypothesis, it's a sample size, it's a power calculation. And you need some numbers, otherwise you cannot do it. Then you have diagnostic assessment of bifurcation lesion using some imaging 
3D CTA. I can tell you, I mean, in UK with NICE, the CTA with fractional flow reserve with FFRCT has really penetrated the milieu and has reduced the cost significantly by 357 pounds per, uh, per patient, eliminating a lot of diagnosis. Now, it's not only a diagnose tool, it is a planning tool. You know, some of, uh, we are engaged in this uh, trial where we go to surgery, bypass surgery, without seeing angiography. And I had to convince the surgeon to do that. And it took me about five years, but now they are very, very enthusiastic about that. Uh, and, and the first, the first 42 patients have been enrolled with a feasibility and a safety because we control everything by a multi-slice CT scan 30 days later of 100%. And I'm pretty sure that we will finish that uh, first in men with 140 patients with a feasibility close to 100%. And clearly, when, when you see the anatomy, when you see the calcium the day before, when you see the angulation, the maximal angulation for the bifurcation, the presence of the calcium, the fact that there is some kind of foreshortening, that there is no overlap in that projection between the proximal LED and the circumflex, the next day you have already your rotablator of lithoplasty ready, uh, you know exactly in which projection you are going to work. I don't need to see the ostium, but I have to see the bifurcation of the main stem. On the multi-slice CT scan, you have clearly that projection. So I think it will come in our world. You know, it comes in our world. The functional, I'm a little bit less enthusiastic for that, but I think certainly somebody is going to propose there. I have seen uh, last week in London a lot of trial coming uh, opposing function and OCT, and OCT lesion, the risky lesion. You know, many of us believe that the so-called vulnerable plaque cannot be necessarily predicted by FFR and IFR. So on the other hand, you have the OCT or FR, which reconcile both you get exactly the quality of the plaque, but you get also your uh, hemodynamic effect because after all, it's the anatomy who define the physiology and not the reverse. So, revascularization type, percutaneous versus surgical revascularization. I think that if the surgeon has a hard time with the valve, and uh, at ESC, Marty Leon said, the next uh, frontier for the interventional cardiologist is the tricuspid, the tricuspid because the surgeon don't like to touch that. I think that there is a reaction of the surgical community. Uh, I have seen that. I've been, I've uh, I really experienced that. Uh, Frederick Moore, which is a great friend of mine, said, I want to have the 10 years follow-up of the syntax, you know. I said, yeah, but we don't have the money. I'll find the money. And then he went to the surgical organization uh, in Germany, and we got the money to get this uh, 10 years follow-up, which is full of surprise. You will see that in the literature, it's already there, in the sense that there are a lot of things which converge after 10 years in order to get divide forever more and more. And it's not what the surgeon was expecting. They were expecting that with a diabetic, the curve would diverge forever. That's not true. They were expecting that for the female, the curve would diverge forever. That's not true. So there is full of surprise, and you have seen the data on the bifurcation. It is interesting that we have a quote unquote, like in James Bond film, and a license to kill, when there is no bifurcation, three vessel disease without bifurcation, it's for us. It's amazing the result at 10 years. You have seen the curve. 
I said in the talk, surprise, surprise, that's the best group. But when you start to have one, two, or three, that's another story. So that's almost the end. And then uh, pharmacological treatment. I mean, uh, if you got these, uh, we were co talking about drug coating balloon. You should realize that there's four with sirolimus. And you should not do that with taxus. You should do that with sirolimus. Because the sirolimus now stay almost three months in the vessel wall. You know, this microsphere, nanosphere, electrostatic stuff, uh, that, that seems to work quite well. At least you eliminate the uh, constrictive uh, mod, uh, remodeling. So the drug, I think that it will come. Uh, we'll, you will have to work on the drug, not only on the uh, uh, P2Y12, but at certain point you will have to do what we did many years ago. Without looking at the cholesterol, we give statin post-PCI in one group and nothing in the other. I don't know if you remember that trial called LIPS, who went in JAMA. Six months later, it was in the guideline. After PCI, you don't need to look at the cholesterol, you have to give statin. So I think it could be that we will have something similar with uh, PCSK9, you know. We have now one shot of COVID every year, the boost, okay? But you will have one shot of inclycerin bringing the cholesterol to 50 milligram. And uh, it's a little bit of scoop, but uh, the other day, I heard that Jean Brownwas has held the cholesterol of 21 milligram. 21 milligram, I don't know what he's doing, but uh, that's the value that was set in the debate with uh, Yagat Narulat, who was jealous of Bonwa because his LDL cholesterol is 25. So he want to be like uh, Jean Bonwa. I think that's the end. Now, if there is some burning proposal, yeah, otherwise, uh, I think we will go for some moment to go on. Thank you very much, Patrick, for an excellent end on, on those two days setting the scene for the armamentarium we have within bifurcation studies. We have come to the end of the program, and on behalf of the, the committee, and especially on behalf of Yves Loire, I would like to thank you all for all your...